Welcome back to this series of lectures on Marx's uh, philosophy, politics, and economics. Today we're going to talk about Marx's critique of political economy, focusing on uh, volume one of Capital. This text is subtitled A Critique of Political Economy. And uh, the object of its critique is the self consciousness of capitalism as represented in the political economy of Smith, Ricardo, Malthus, and Stuart. Uh, by taking the foremost defenders of capitalism at their word, Marx seeks to expose capitalism's self-understanding, the belief that it consummates a marriage between freedom and equality, as an um, obfuscation for, of its real basis on unfreedom and inequality. In criticizing uh, capitalism's theoretical self-understanding, Marx hopes to indict the material precondition of that understanding, namely capitalism itself and the capitalist mode of production. Now, capital consists effectively of three volumes, four if you count the uh, uh, posthumously uh, named uh, Theories of Surplus Value, uh, but only volume one was published during Marx's lifetime. It was published in 1867, uh, but we know that all three volumes of Capital were in rough draft, at least, uh, ready for publication before Marx died. So uh, Engels edited uh, volumes two and three after Marx's death, and the fourth volume of Capital, The Theories of Surplus Value, was published, uh, I think, by Kautsky. Uh, a bit later. Now, in the first lecture, uh, I, I introduced some key concepts from classical political economy, especially Smith's and Ricardo's theories of value, and the putative inverse relationship between wages and profit. Today, I will take you through a guided tour of Capital, Volume 1. Uh, this is by far, I think, Marx's most scientifically engaging and influential text. It is also his most difficult. Um, so what I'll do is I'll walk you through some of the main arguments of the book. And after reading chapters one, and I suggest also four to six and 24, 25, I think you will also mightily benefit if you read either Romer's uh, Free to Lose or uh, Foley's Understanding Capital. So what I'll start with is um, what I take to be a rough outline of the argument and the structure of that argument and um, taking Marx at his word. And then I'm gonna focus on some individual chapters and try to draw some parallels between them. So, um, after the publication of Capital, Volume 1, some people, many people, wondered what Marx was on about, and some parts of the text, which were very obscure, called for elaboration. So Marx sent a number of letters elaborating on the text, not only to dear Fred Engels, but also to uh, one of his friends, Kugelman. Uh, so in a 1968 letter to Kugelman, Marx provides a summary of his main contribution to political economy and its criticism. And he writes, uh, every child knows that the amount of products corresponding to different amounts of need, uh, demand, uh, differing and quantitatively determined amounts of society's aggregate labor. It is self-evident that this necessity of the distribution of social labor in specific proportions is certainly not abolished by the specific form of social production. 
it can only change its form of manifestation. Natural laws cannot be abolished at all. The only thing that can change under historically differing conditions is the form in which those laws assert themselves and the form in which this proportional distribution of labor asserts itself in a state of society in which the interconnection of social labor expresses itself as the private exchange of the individual products of labor is precisely the exchange value of these products. So Marx says a lot of things here about natural laws, natural laws of proportionality of distribution of labor. This is a, an idea that Marx inherits from, from the physocrats and Smith. Um, and so the content of this natural law, let's depict it in this figure. So uh, in this figure, we can represent labor transfers. And suppose there are uh, three producers and they um, uh, represented by individual nodes. The L's represent the amount of labor that each gives or each receives. And Marx's model assumes that labor quality is homogeneous across those who give it so that it reflects equal effort and intensity. These definitions would generalize to any sufficiently complex uh, economic system, be it pre-capitalist, capitalist, or post-capitalist, with many producers. So in figure one, um, you get the structure of labor transfers and therefore of net labor transfers in an economy with three producers, A, B, C, each producer is a node, each node either gives or receives labor or both. And the assumption here is that every human receives a portion of total social labor, a portion of the net product, um, because she needs to eat, to sleep, to clothe, to interact with others socially. Uh, and now this makes it possible to calculate the net labor consumed or received by each node for any number of nodes and bilateral relations. So by way of illustration, consider a slave owning society. A owns two slaves, a, a, B and C. Um, and so assuming a simple production function, say a linear production function, such that one unit of labor produces one unit of output. And suppose B and C each give um, 10 units of labor, which means they each produce 10 units of output. Uh, B and C then consume five units of labor each, uh, but A gives zero units and consumes 10. This economy generates a net product of 20, 10 plus 10, um, 20 widgets, let's say, a surplus of 10 widgets, um, and a corresponding amount of surplus labor equal to 10 units of labor, all of which is consumed by A. So in this example, A is a net consumer of labor and is a net consumer of surplus labor. And since, let us assume, uh, A is a slave owner, so extracts this labor through direct control over B's and C's conditions of labor and B's and C's labor as such, it follows that A exploits B and C. Uh, and I think this kind of set of labor transfers does not is not restricted to a slave owning economy. So when these general conditions hold, so uh, there's a consumption of, um, of surplus labor, and um, uh, someone extracts the labor by dint of power over others, there is a exploitation. And that exploitation obtains generically in any economic system. So now what's important is to explain how capitalist exploitation, if such a thing exists, differs from slavery, 
or from serfdom or from the patriarchy. And Marx says that it differs in terms of its formal features, not the content of the law, but the form of the law that changes. So in the letter to Kugelman, Marx says that the natural law of proportional distribution of labor uh, changes form, and its form under capitalism is exchange value. How is this form exploited? Under slavery and feudalism and the patriarchy, uh, the extraction of the surplus labor of the slave, the serf, and the wife, respectively, transpires as the forcible uh, appropriation of that labor by master, lord, and husband, respectively. And we might here add uh, the exploitation uh, by party members of everyday workers in the former uh, one-party uh, dictatorships of Eastern Europe. These are all exploitative social forms. But this isn't, this isn't the form that exploitation takes under capitalism. So here's an illustration. Suppose uh, B in uh, our example is a cook in a competitive capitalist economy. She does not own or manage her own cook shop, and she also lacks uh, non-market access to cooking materials. She must therefore sell her ability to work, her cooking power, to A, the cook shop owner, in order to earn the wherewithal to buy her means of subsistence. This gives A power over B through control over B's cooking labor. If B produces more value added than she receives as wages, which is then appropriated by A, then A extracts surplus labor. And since that surplus extraction obtains through A's control over B's conditions of production, A exploits B. So here, the labor in this rudimentary example, the labor of the cook, supposing she she's a wage laborer, she sells her cooking power to uh, the cook shop owner in the market, in the labor market, this power of the cook appears as her own private property, a power she's free to dispose at the going wage rate. So insofar as markets are competitive and in equilibrium, the cook receives the full value of what she sells, namely her labor power, in the form of a wage. The typical Marxian move here is to argue that this appearance conceals an essence. It conceals the exploitative essence of capitalist exchange, which consists in the cook producing value added above the value of her labor power. This surplus labor constitutes the profit appropriated by the capitalist. So the difference between exploitation under slavery, feudalism, and patriarchy on the one hand, and capitalism on the other, is that the latter presupposes a separation between appearance, the juridical fiction of the labor contract, and reality, the alienation of the cook's surplus labor to the cookshop owner. Under capitalism, the alienation of labor must necessarily appear as a relation between equally positioned, equally positioned uh, commodity owners. This is what accounts for the necessary form of appearance under capitalism um, of freedom and equality. But this is illusory because the cookshop owner who controls the conditions of the cook's labor enables her to control and exploit that labor. So it follows, according to Marx, that uh, capitalism is an exploitative social system which necessarily appears as a system of freedom and equality. But once we see through its categories and take these categories to their logical conclusion, we will come to see, like Ricardo did in the nascent form, that this is 
uh, an exploitative system, a system of unfreedom and inequality. So now, if the, all these claims are true, then it follows, according to Marx, that the working day under capitalism is split in two parts, one spent by workers working on their own subsistence, which they receive as wages in return for the commodity they sell, and another part working gratis for the capitalist. These divisions are depicted semantically uh, for the whole economy in this table. Uh, the working day is split in two parts, paid and unpaid labor time, uh, all of which constitute the length of the working day. The wage bill is proportional to the paid part of the working day, and profits are proportional to the unpaid uh, part of the working day. So, if this is true, then the features of capitalist production that make it appear as a system of equality and freedom turn out, as Marx puts it, to be inequality and unfreedom. Marx says this explicitly in uh, the rough draft of capital, the so-called Grundrisse. And it now follows that capitalism uh, and this necessary appearance of unfreedom uh, and inequality as freedom and equality are necessarily and uniquely coextensive. Capital is labor exploited under the juridical fiction of a free and equal exchange of commodities. So this is how uh, the capitalist mode of production appears. This is what its substance is, not freedom and equality, but unfreedom and inequality. And because this is uh, constitutive, this form of appearance and this form of substance and this content of the appearance and its main explanation is constitutive of the mode of capitalist mode of production. This is why even geniuses like Smith and Ricardo didn't manage to see through this secret of the commodity form. So this is, in summary, is, uh, the crux of the argument uh, of the um, capital volume one and I think the three volumes of capital are an attempt to explain the form that the subjugation of labor assumes under capitalism as Marx put it in his letter to Kugelman and others. So what we're going to do now is try to make these claims a bit more specific by looking more closely at the text. So chapter one of volume one of capital volume one <laughs> begins the wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense collection of commodities it follows that the critique of political economy is concerned with one particular form of wealth that of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails we're therefore dealing with a system of fully developed generalized commodity production and in such a society, Marx adds, wealth appears as, an, appears as an immense collection of commodities. So, as we will see, Marx adheres to the Enlightenment idea that appearances presuppose essences or substances, and it is the job of science to make the latter manifest. So, Marx sets out from an analysis, as he calls it, of the commodity. The commodity has two aspects, use value and exchange value. The use value of the commodity is its power to satisfy human needs. And it constitutes, Marx says, the material content of wealth independently of its social form. Exchange value, on the other hand, is the power of commodities to exchange for one another. It's a relational property. And um, as exchange values are mutually replaceable, uh, uh, according to Marx, he infers that the exchange values that saturate the marketplace must somehow express something equal, and therefore exchange value is but the form of appearance of a content distinguishable from it. But what is that content? 
To answer this question, Marx introduces a further distinction between content, between concrete and abstract labor, which he claims corresponds to the distinction between use and exchange value. So concrete labor is the useful object-directed labor of the joiner, the mason, or the weaver, versus this uh, mysterious entity of abstract labor. In its character as an exchange value, Marx says, products lose the determinate, useful character of the kinds of labor embodied in them, and are all reduced to the same kind of labor, human labor in the abstract. Abstract labor thus has a phantom-like objectivity, he says, a homo of homogeneous, as homogeneous human labor. So to sum up, commodities are use values brought for sale to market. They're not use values for the one who owns them, because otherwise she wouldn't be selling them. And they're only exchange values for her. They look for someone to be purchased as exchange values, but consumed as use values. And it follows from the definition of a commodity that, as such, they are objects of exchange and only of exchange. They're therefore exchange values. Exchange values uh, are explained uh, by certain content. They have a certain content. That content is value. And um, in exchange, things sold at value abstract from their useful qualities, including the useful qualities embodied in them by the concrete labor that creates them, such that as values, commodities only express abstract labor. So value is what Marx says explains exchange value. Uh, in order to explain value, we need to understand abstract labor. But what is this um, value? Marx thinks that this objective character of values as values and this phantom-like objectivity uh, is a social, a purely social feature. So that character, he says, can only appear in the social relation between different commodities. Um, so consider an analogy with kingship. Marx says that one man is king only because other men stand in the relation of subjects to him. So kingship is a purely social relation and something similar is true of value. Um, so Marx is here gradually building up to the idea that capital is a form of social relations with its own internal logic and not a, an eternal um, extra social or non-relational structure. This appearance of the commodity or of money and of capital as non-relational or natural monadic predicates Marx calls fetishism. Um, so fetishism in general describes the definite social relations relation between men themselves, which assumes the fantastic form of a relation between things. Uh, this isn't this is Marx's version of fetishism, picking up on a motif from Hegel and Forbach. It has nothing to do with what Freud calls fetishism, which has to do with the attachment of consciousness to a specific an irrelevant feature of a, of a thing. In order to understand what this means, Marx transports us back to the world of religion, where the products of the human brain, he says, he says, appear as autonomous figures endowed with a life of their own. So here Marx also picks up uh, an important chord, strikes an important chord that will later be picked up by Nietzsche, who thought that Christianity represents the, the systematic infliction of self-harm by human on human. In religion, human dominates human through the product of her own ideas. So just as man is governed in religion by the product of his own brain, so in capitalist production, he's governed by the products of his own hand. This is once more the Feuerbachian motif of inversion. Um, you remember subject becomes predicate and subject and uh, predicate becomes subject. 
But in what sense does this misty realm of religion shed light on productive relations in a commodity-producing capitalist society? In such a society, Marx says, to the producers, the social relations between their private labors appears, appears what they are, are, i.e., they do not appear as direct social relations between persons and their work, but rather as material relations between persons and social relations between things. Notice that Marx does not say that in these societies social relations appear as material relations between persons and social relations between things, and this appearance is just an illusion, as religion is. In such societies, in such societies it appears that private labors take the form of social relations, the social relations between things, between, because um, in a sense they do. Things assume a personality of their own, and persons thereby shed their personality to things. Remember again the uh, um, sorcerer's apprentice image from uh, the Communist Manifesto. So how does this work? Um, Marx's commodity fetishism story is perhaps easier to understand as a conclusion of an important explanation he offers in section 4 of chapter 1. Namely his, namely, his explanation of the value form. He says, The mysterious character of the commodity form consists, therefore, simply in the fact that the commodity reflects the social characteristics of men on own labor as objective characteristics of the products of labor themselves, as the social natural properties of these things. Hence, it also reflects the social relations of the producers to the sum total of labor as a social relation between objects, a relation which exists apart and outside uh, the producers. A little later on, Marx writes, relatedly, political economy has analyzed value and its magnitude and has uncovered the content concealed within these forms, but it has never once ask the question why this content has assumed that particular form, that is to say, why labor is represented by the value of its product and labor time by the magnitude of that value. So Marx is, ar is asking here for an explanation why, under the historically determinate social form under scrutiny, namely capitalism, social exchange between humans assumes the form of exchange between their products, you know, the exchangeability relations between these things as they come into contact with one another when they're commodities. Not here, they're not commodities here. I don't sell pens, I don't sell diaries, don't sell lectures. Um, but when they do come, uh, in contact in the market, their form magically changes. And his answer is that under capitalism, producers produce privately. The only way their individual labors, the labor of pen production and the labor of uh, diary production, can become socially useful is through the medium of the market. The market's function is to transform the producer's private concrete labor into social labor. It does this through the mediation of money, which is nothing but the external manifestation, Marx thinks, of abstract labor, labor shorn of its individualized concrete features. In a word, uh, labor under capitalism is expressed in money. The production of this gets validated only when reaches out and grasps a certain amount of exchange value. So under commodity production, the abstract labor congealed in the commodity appears as a social property of the product of labor, not of the labor itself. This, lender, this renders laboring activity only indirectly social. It's not my labor in making the pen that matters. What matters is the um, relation that pen begets with the diary and with 
uh, other objects in the market. This is what validates my labor in producing them, not my labor. Um, the joint activities of individual producers become wholly dependent of the, on the realization of value in the process of purchase and sale. What does this mean? Well, suppose I produce chairs, you produce axes. In feudal society, says Marx, my need for axes in order to produce chairs is satisfied through personal relations. The lord of the manor procures the axes, which you produce and I receive. Uh, both you and I are rewarded from the common surplus under the aegis of the, the feudal lord. Or alter alternatively, we can exchange in kind. Uh, so here, the social relations between individuals in their performance of their labor appear at all events as their own personal relations and are not disguised as social relations between things, between the products of labor. This process is only complete under capitalism. And moreover, the discovery of this historical specificity of capital's form of appearance gives rise to the possibility says Marx, that it will be superseded by a community of free individuals carrying on their work with the means of production in common, in which the labor power of all the different individuals is consciously applied as the combined labor power of the community. Marx's idea here is that products in this free association will, be, will not be treated as commodities, that is, treated as uh, values, and therefore will not validate the individual pen producing private labor as abstract labor, as money. By implication, things will not have a dominion over, over persons such that things are no longer personified and persons no longer reified. My labor and my ability to, to realize it and my ability by implication to realize myself will not depend on the relationship between these things and the amount of money these things sell for. <sighs> so they will no longer have a sorcerer's apprentice like presence floating over me and controlling me like uh, a marionette. So in volume one of Capital, Marx is anxious to show that his results um, conceiving the exploitative nature of capital social relations are true even if all markets are perfectly competitive. That is, there is no monopoly market, no monopsonies, no monopolies, and all prices correspond to cost of production, labor values. You will recall Smith's early and rude state here. So throughout volume one, Marx assumes that the labor theory of value is true, such that prices correspond to labor values. This has polemical significance because it implies for Marx that the best argument for capital, the strongest possible version of any defense of capitalism and of a self, any self-representation of capital, is subject to insuperable objections. So Marx writes, in order to extract value out of the consumption of a commodity, our friend, money bags, must be so lucky as to find, within the sphere of circulation, a commodity whose use value possesses the peculiar property of being a source of value, whose actual consumption, therefore, is itself an embodiment of labor and consequently a creation of value. What we are looking for here is uh, the consumption of a use value, this is a necessary condition for buying commodity, which like all consumption takes place outside the sphere of circulation and during which a sufficient amount of value is created. So there's new value being produced, uh, adding uh, value to the product such that more total value uh, comes in, comes out than gets in. And Marx concludes uh, the possessor of money does find such a commodity, such a special commodity on the market, the capacity for labor, in other words, labor power. So what's special about labor power? Marx's answer is that it produces more value than it consumes. It lays the golden eggs. It is therefore the source, says Marx, of surplus value. 
This argument has the following structure. Commodities exchange at their values. This is an assumption. And it's polemically significant, as I said, because uh, it rules out the possibility that um, surplus value and the exploitation of labor comes from market imperfections. Marx does not want to assume this. Many of the socialists of his time thought that exploitation issues from market imperfections. Marx uh, doesn't think this. Marx thinks that the perfect frictionless capitalist market involves exploitation. If you add market imperfections, you'll make things much worse. But he wants to defeat the Mike Tyson version of uh, the defense of capitalism. He doesn't want to defeat someone who makes it easy on herself. So commodities exchange at their values. If commodities exchange at their values, then surplus value is not created in circulation. That's a lemma. And Marx will try to prove in chapters four and five of volume one of Capital. Therefore, three, surplus value is not created in circulation, but in production. This follows from one, two, and the mutual exhaustiveness of circulation and production. Surplus value is produced by hiring a commodity that creates more value than it consumes. It's another assumption. That commodity is labor power and labor power only. That's another lemma that Marx sets out to prove in, in uh, chapters five and six of volume one. Therefore, six, labor power and labor power alone creates surplus value. Now, this argument uh, has come under scrutiny by Marxist and non-Marxist economists alike. And subject wor subsequent work uh, from the late, um, late 19th century until quite uh, recently in the 1960s and 70s uh, by Marxist economists has questioned the soundness of lemmas two and five. And if lemmas two and five are unfounded, then claim six does not follow. And that means that Marxist economics needs rethinking or it's inconsistent. Um, but fortunately, one of the main developments in Marxian economics in the 1980s is the so-called uh, new interpretation of the labor theory of value, largely due to uh, 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 Duncan Foley and Gerard Dumenil, who uh, effectively managed to provide a consistent mathematical interpretation of Marx's uh, arguments in volume one, volume three of Capital, such that they preserve the content of claim six. But this is, you know, a uh, very heavy going mathematical um, Marxian economics. If you're interested, you can check out uh, Foley's Understanding Capital or Romer's Free to Lose if you want to look further into that. Now let's talk a little bit about the central constitutive relation of capital, wage labor, and capital. So a necessary condition for exploitation, things Marx, is that the direct producer be separated from her means of subsistence and her, and her means of production. The snail must be separated from the shell. And this is why the snail must sell her labor power, which is the only commodity she can sell in order to obtain the wherewithal to survive. So by implication, for the transformation of money into capital, this worker must be free in the double sense that as a free individual, he can dispose of his labor power as his own commodity. And that, on the other hand, he has no other commodity for sale. He is rid of them. He is free of all the objects needed for the realization of his labor power. 
Um, so here Marx gives us some further hints as to the logical hierarchy of his concepts. The mere existence of money, the mere existence of commodities, the mere existence of even universal commodity production are not sufficient for capitalism proper. Rather, capitalist production arises only when the owner of the means of production and subsistence finds the free worker available on the market as the seller of his own labor power. This is how capital announces, says Marx, the new epoch in the process of social production. This epoch, the capitalist epoch, is characterized by this, he says, that labor power takes in the eyes of the laborer himself the form of a commodity which is his property. His labor consequently becomes wage labor. On the other hand, it is only from this moment that the produce of labor universally becomes a commodity. The commodity form of the products of labor was not universal before labor power was itself turned into a commodity, for labor power itself is a product of labor. Now, if Marx's argument is sound, then the production of surplus value must take place outside production, in the hidden abode of production. It is for this reason that the move from the sphere of circulation to the sphere of production takes us, Marx says, from the very Eden of the innate rights of man, the realm of freedom, equality, property, and Bentham, Marx says, to the realm of a dominating and exploitative hierarchy, where he who before was the money owner now strides in front as capitalist, the possession the possessor of labor power follows as his laborer, the one with an air of importance, smirking, intent on business, the other timid and holding back, like one who is bringing his own hide to market and has nothing to expect but a hiding. I have linked here to a song by uh, Rise Against uh, song entitled, entitled um, Prayer of the Refugee. And the song is a perfect representation, I thought when I first saw it, the video clip rather, is a perfect representation of, of this idea. Uh, so there's the band, they walk into a mall, this glittering world, temple of the commodity, and they walk through it, they start breaking stuff, and then eventually they get to the back and the back they open a door and they enter the hidden abode of production they enter a world where exploited and uh, dominated people produce all the glittering stuff that's being sold and um, bought in the market in the mall as commodities um, the hidden abode of production. Okay, so we've only got up to <laughs> chapter six. Um, so the rest of Marx's book from chapter seven onwards is an attempt to articulate how the categories already broached manifest themselves in an industrial capitalist economy with a developed division of labor. Um, so in chapter 11, Marx explains clearly what form the domination of labor takes under these conditions. Um, it is no longer the worker who employs the means of production, but the means of production which employ the worker. Instead of being consumed by him, uh, as material elements of his productive activity, they consume him as the ferment necessary to their own life process. And the life process of capital consists solely in its motion as self-valorizing value. As soon as a certain sum of money is transformed into means of production, the means of production themselves are transformed into a title, both by right and by might, to the labor and surplus labor of others. So machines dominate humans, and they're set in motion by themselves, they're self-moving in a way, and their agent 
his capital and the capitalists. So this is once again the Forbachian motif of inversion, subject predicate inversion. The capitalist division of labor, let's say, let's talk a little bit about this because it's very important. In chapters 13 and 15, Marx explains why this division, this inversion that I've just mentioned, in inversion between labor and cap, between uh, uh, subject and predicate, machine and human, is salutary, indeed indispensable for human emancipation. So Marx says, when a worker cooperates in a planned way with others, he strips off the fetters of his individuality and develops the capacities of his species. This development is impossible, I think, without a large number of workers in the same place. And under capitalism, says Marx, this assemblage can only be afforded by a large purse. So it is only a large purse that can employ such a large number of labor powers. So the development of humanity as a species comes to depend on the extent to which a single capitalist has command over the means of subsistence of a number of workers. And she has that because she controls the means of production, which are used to produce means of subsistence. Hence, under capitalism, the productive development of the human species only grows at the expense of individual human beings. So this is once again the objective alienation motif we encountered in Marx's early writings. There is no epistemological break here. Here's a representative passage, this time from chapter 15. In handicrafts and, handicrafts and manufacture, the worker makes use of a tool. In the factory, the machine makes use of him. In manufacture, the workers are the parts of a living mechanism. In the factory, we have a lifeless mechanism which is independent of the workers who are incorpor incorporated into it as its living appendages. Now, you can direct 50 movies out of this passage, and 50 movies or more have been directed. Um, but it may be useful to begin to reconstruct the image that Marx is painting here. So Marx explicitly mentions the absurd tale, he says, of Menenius Agrippa, the, the Roman patrician, who drew an analogy in the case of the Roman uh, plebeian re rebellions between the patricians on the one hand and the plebeians on the other, saying that the patricians are the stomach of society uh, and the plebeians are the limbs. The limbs need the stomach because otherwise there is no one to digest the food and transfer it to the limbs. Marx claims that this tale is realized in manufacture. In manufacturing, the worker becomes her own limbs. This is caused by the crippling one-sidedness of the division of labor. And in large-scale industry, the worker becomes the limbs of a lifeless cell-moving thing, the machine. So, uh, Charlie Chaplin, mo uh, Modern Times, first comes to mind. Uh, uh, we can think of even more horrible ways to represent this. And Marx explicitly refers to Frankenstein and Dracula and other uh, absurd and bizarre concoctions of 19th century horror literature. So at this point, Marx is taking us further into that dark archetype of modernity, the factory. This is an automaton in which the worker functions as a conscious organ. And I think Marx claims that there's a certain pedagogy of the machine that pervades capitalist society. Machinery is misused in order to transform the worker from his very childhood into a part of a specialized machine. Um, note the term misused here. So Marx incessantly insists that no sane person can be against the use of machinery per se. So he says, um, here, as everywhere else, we must distinguish between 
the increased productivity, which is due to the development of the social process of production, and that which is due to the exploitation by the capitalists of that development. It follows that there is increased productivity, which is not due to exploitation, and which is not, by dint of that fact, objectionable. This attempt by the manufacturers to compete with industrialists becomes ever more hopeless as technology gets incorporated into industry. So our, as Marx put it, um, echoing the words of the Communist Manifesto, modern industry never views or treats the existing form of a production process as a definitive one. Its technical basis is therefore revolutionary whereas all earlier mod modes of production were essentially conservative. Thus, large-scale industry, by its very nature, necessitates variation of labor, fluidity of functions, and mobility of the worker in all directions. But on the other hand, in its capitalist form, it reproduces the old division of labor with its all ossified particularities. Large-scale industry thus has momentous significance and promise for the development of the powers of the human race, were it not for its capitalist form. But as Marx puts it, what avails lamentation in the face of historical necessity? Through its very crisis and catastrophes of overproduction, unemployment, exploitation and domination, large-scale industry holds the promise of replacing that monstrosity the disposable working population held in reserve in misery for the changing requirements of capitalist exploitation with the individual man who is absolutely available for the different kinds of labor required of him. The partially developed individual who is merely the bearer of one specialized social function must be replaced by the totally developed individual for whom the different social functions are different modes of activity he takes up in turn. Now, different readings of these passages are possible. Uh, one reading of, of this passage and many other passages in the Grunrisse and in the um, contribution to a critique, read this passage as uh, Marx postulating an overambitious account of human development as all-round Leonardo da Vinci type development. But another reading of the passage is that um, capital, religion, and the state restrict and constrain human individuality to these specialized social functions and make it very difficult, if not impossible, for you to be Milton if you don't have the withal required by uh, capitalist, but the capitalist mode of production to be Milton. Um, and Marx thinks if you're Milton, if you have Milton in you, then Milton should be developed. Uh, and he says in the theories, and surplus, uh, theories of surplus value that uh, Milton produced his writings like the silkworm produces silk. It was part of his nature. Um, and it might be that the capitalist mode of production just doesn't allow this realization of nature, at least does not allow it at its fully developed form. According to Marx, this will only obtain with what he calls the inevitable conquest of political power by the working class. So uh, Marx says some things about this in uh, the later chapters of volume one and intimates the subjective conditions for, the, for its possibility in his political writings, especially the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte and the Civil War in France. Um, I'll let you read through these texts at your own time. So to conclude, um, what I've tried to do here is guide you through some of the main themes of a difficult and sometimes inscrutable text. Uh, Marx's arguments are sometimes muddled and some of his predictions have been proven false. 
The suggestion, for example, that the conquest of political power by working people is inevitable uh, is probably false. Um, the, increase, the idea that the increasing centralization of capital and socialization of labor will inevitably lead to, ver over, to the overthrow of the capitalist mode of production uh, has been proven false. And I think also the narrow technological reading of historical materialism is also very probably false. But I think that Marx's normative account of human flourishing, which we studied in um, lecture two, the associated theory of history, not the technological theory, the, the technological materialist theory, but rather the objective alienation account of historical materialism, but also Marx's account of the exploitation of human productive agency are all still relevant. I hope you enjoyed this course.